Good day everybody. My name is Gretchen van Seil. I'm an advanced tennis instructor licensed through Tennis South Africa. I've been coaching tennis for 20 years now and since 2016 I have been focusing a lot of my coaching on working with children with ADHD. So today I want to talk about what it is like to coach children with ADHD specifically in tennis and also a lot of the information I will be giving will be from research I have done and a lot of the information will be from personal experience working with these children. So we're going to start talking about what is ADHD, the symptoms of ADHD, what people with ADHD may experience and the statistics of ADHD. So what is ADHD? It is Attention Deficit and Hyperactivity Disorder. So what is important here to know is that a lot of the children may be inattentive predominant and a lot of them might be hyperactive predominant. Sometimes it will be both, it's just something to keep in mind. Now, ADHD is a common neurodevelopmental disorder of childhood and it may persist into adulthood. It may contribute to low self-esteem and difficulty at school or work. And also what's important here to realize is when a child comes to you for their tennis lessons, you must keep in mind that a lot of times They've had a difficult day at school. The teachers could have been impatient with them. Classmates could have been impatient with them. So just keep that in mind when working with children with ADHD. Now, ADHD is that feeling that you have that you've, got, you've forgotten something and then waiting to find out if it's important. It's happened to a lot of us. You walk into a room in your house and you think, what am I doing here? You can't remember. That is what it feels like to have ADHD on a daily basis. Now the symptoms of ADHD. Inattention. They have a short attention span for their age. Difficulty listening to others, especially teachers. Impulsivity. Putting themselves in situations where they can get hurt or often interrupting other people. So this is the reason why tennis is the perfect sport for children with ADHD. A lot of the sports like rugby, netball, hockey, it's a little bit dangerous for them because they are impulsive. They want to go where the action is. So they will sometimes run and to where the ball is, they will run, they will tackle somebody and they can put themselves in danger and also the other players in danger. Hyperactivity, moving constantly with no apparent goal. You will see on court these children, they're just moving and you're standing there, it's like, what are you doing? And they can't tell you, they don't know, they just have this urge to keep on moving the whole time. So you're going to have to be sometimes patient with them and just let them move about while you're busy presenting your lesson. Children with ADHD may have all of these symptoms or a combination of them. It's not to say that if a child is hyperactive that they do have ADHD. What people with ADHD may experience? Behavioural can be aggression, irritability, fidgeting, impulsivity, hyperactivity. So this is where it's going to be important to know your student very well because they might get aggressive during their lesson, they might get aggressive during a match. So if you have this background and you know how to work with them, it will help you to help them get focused on the court and maybe maintain that aggression, that irritability that they will feel when playing a match. In cognitive, Forgetfulness, difficulty focusing, absent-mindedness, short attention span, problems paying attention. So your ADHD student will be the one that usually leaves his bottle or his racket or something on court. They are forgetful. There is a little bit of a disconnect between the short-term memory and the long-term memory. So just keep that in mind. You will see them walking off court, leaving all this stuff there. Just remind them sometimes, listen, come and pick up your things. We still have to do this or we still have to do that. Just keep in mind that they do get forgetful sometimes. Then their mood. Mood swings, anger, anxiety, boredom, excitement. So here for me the most important one is the anxiety. So as I said earlier, when a student gets to you on the tennis court for their lesson, it can be 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock, 5 o'clock, that child most likely had a difficult day already. A teacher could have been yelling at them about 20 times during the day to sit still, to keep focus. And they might feel that their classmates are getting impatient with them because they're not hearing everything a teacher is saying. So that anxiety that they feel, they will bring that on court and they will think 
that you will contribute to that anxiety. They will expect you to yell at them or tell them to stand still or do this or that. So keep in mind the anxiety for me is the most important one here. Also common is learning disabilities and depression. So you need to know that ADHD can sometimes be combined with dyslexia or autism or a lot of things. So it's also very important to know the depression, but there's nothing you can do about that. You can make their lessons fun. You can make them want to come to tennis, but you are not a medical professional. You're not a psychologist. So keep in mind that there might be depression, but there's nothing you can do as a tennis coach about that. You're not a medical professional. Statistics. Now, this is where it gets a little bit scary. In South Africa, according to the most recent data, approximately between 8 and 10 percent of the South African population have ADHD. It could be present for, from birth or early childhood and usually persists throughout the person's lifetime. It is not limited to children only. It is widely accepted that 60 to 70 percent of children take their symptoms into adulthood. And in South Africa, 1 million adults have ADHD. Now, coaching children with ADHD, the following topics we're going to talk about is communication with a player, communication with the parents, learning styles, and including children with ADHD in your lessons. Now, communication with players. Do not deliver large blocks of information. So when you're talking to children and there's a kid with ADHD on your court, you know they're not going to focus the whole time. So it's not going to help to give this whole large speech about the drill you're about to do or the footwork exercise they're about to do. Try to keep it as short and as simple as possible to make sure that they maintain that information. Now, do not finish their sentences. Allow them enough time to register what you said and consider their answer. So you told them something to do. They might have a question or they're telling you something. Remember that child with ADHD is probably thinking about the puppy he has at home. He's thinking about what happened at school, thinking about what this person or that person said. So just give them that moment to get their thoughts together and express themselves to you clearly. Okay. Use simple, uncomplicated language and learn to use gestures and subtle changes to the tone and volume of your voice. This will play an important part in communicating your message. So as I said, keep your messages short, instructions short so that they can follow them. Sometimes you can just show them a little gesture like move your feet, do this or that, make a little swing motion and they will understand what you're talking. As you get to know your students better, this will become easier for you to communicate with them because they will learn the gesture, gestures that you use. <clears throat> keep, and, keep a calm and collective tone of voice. The more excited you get, the more excited they will get and they will get overexcited. Now, I know in a lot of the coaching courses that we do, especially in the play and stay level when you're working with the little ones, they do get, encourage us to get excited on the court, to get the kids psyched up. But for children with ADHD, if they get that moment where they're a little bit overexcited, you're going to lose them for the rest of the lesson. So you can still keep them in the lesson. You can still keep them positive with the rewards and things like that. But just keep it a little bit calmer. The way you're talking, just talk a little bit calmer. You can still tell them you did an excellent job. You did a great job. You don't need to go all over the place and be overexcited with them. Do not use the words, do you understand? They may say yes, because they're scared you're going to single them out and then everybody in the group is going to be a little bit frustrated because you have to repeat what you just said to them. So rather ask them, what do you do after hitting the ball? Where do you go next? Ask them a simple question, then you will know if they understood what they had to do or not. And then repeat, repeat, repeat. If necessary, using different words, different gestures. Children with ADHD will miss information, but they will not realize that they have missed something. So even if it takes a little bit of time out of your lesson, I know a lot of lessons you have 45 minutes, you have an hour, hour and a half, take that couple of minutes, repeat yourself, and just make sure that they get the information. Rather have 15 minutes in a lesson where they're focused, 
and doing what they're supposed to do and where they're learning and doing a whole hour session where they don't know anything, where they're not learning anything. Now, communication with parents, this is extremely important. And I'm going to start with a statement that says, don't ask, don't tell. So you're not going to go to a parent and ask them, listen, does your child have ADHD? You do not know the situation. You do not know if that child has been diagnosed. You don't know what tough day that parent just had to get that child to do five minutes of homework. And then it took them maybe an hour, an hour and a half to finish that. You do not know the situation. You're not going to go to the parents and ask them point blank, listen, does your child have ADHD? Also, don't tell. Don't tell a parent that you think their child has ADHD. Don't go back to where you're coaching and say, listen, I heard this coach talking about coaching children with ADHD. I think your child has ADHD. You don't. You don't know the situation once again. You don't know what they're going through as a family. You don't know the difficulties they're facing. So you can't tell them, listen, your child has ADHD. You are not a medical professional. If a parent volunteers this information, then yes, you can discuss, discuss this with them. You can ask them about the learning styles of the child or if the child was aggressive on the court. You can then ask them, listen, how do you handle this situation in your home? Because then you can know, okay, we can use what they do in the house, bring it to the tennis court and it will be a fluent thing going from their home to the tennis court and it will be more in a routine for the child to know what's going to happen, how you're going to handle their aggression. Do not give your opinion on medication. I do have a very strong opinion on medication, but I'm not going to share that with anyone. Once again, you are not a medical professional. You do not know how severe that child's ADHD is. You can't tell a parent, listen, tennis is now going to solve your problems. Don't take medication. Or you want the child to be on their medication when they come to tennis. You do not know. You are not a medical professional. Learning styles. Okay, this is also very important. 83% of children learn visually, 11% auditory, and 6% through, kinesthet through kinesthetics. So with the learning style, it's also very important to know yourself as a coach. You need to know what your preferred learning style is so that you don't go on the court. If you're an auditory learner, like I am, you're, you're going to want to explain things more. You want to talk a lot because that's the way you learn. You first need to know what type of learner you are so that you don't transfer that to your students and try to explain everything to a visual person or you try to, for an auditory learner, try to show them everything auditory. <clears throat> if you cannot identify what type of a learner a student is, ask them. Ask them, listen, if your teach, teacher at school is showing you something, what is the easiest way for you to take in the, that information? How do you like a teacher to present that information to you. A lot of children will say, okay, no, I like if they just explain, or I like if they show it to me. It's important. You can ask them. They will tell you. They will give you clues because it's not always easy to know what type of learner a student is. With ADHD children, be careful with the kinesthetic learners. ADHD children do not like to be touched. You will notice in your lessons you're giving everybody a high five, one child will be standing a little bit back or they're holding their hands back. That's your ADHD child. They don't normally like to be touched. So be careful with touching the children, giving high fives if they're a kinesthetic learner also with ADHD. So now, how do you get a student to really watch you if they're a visual learner? What works for me a lot when we're doing drills, I will put up targets for them like we always do. And then I will tell them, okay, if you guys hit the target, you get a reward. My rewards usually for my children are they get to pick a game. They get to choose a shot to add or take out of the drill. They get extra points when they're playing points, but then they do have to hit that target. Then they do get their reward. But then when you have to do your demonstration, especially when you're doing that gag method, the global, the analytical, the global with the ball, sometimes you will do that and you will see the children looking around. And you'll be thinking, oh, I wish they were looking at me. So what I normally do, I tell my children, listen, let's make a little deal. And my kids all know I love making deals. 
So I will tell them when I start with the demonstration, okay, we're doing the uh, forehand, look at the follow through I'm doing, the extended follow through, and then I'll tell them, okay, but what if I hit that cone with a target? What do I get? You guys get to choose a game, you get to choose a shot, what do I get? They will give offers, some will say, I'll buy you a chocolate, I'll buy you a cool drink, and they'll say, no, 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 I want something on court. Like maybe do a push-up, do a sit-up, and then they'll come with suggestions. All the kids will give a suggestion and you take an order. You'll take, okay, I will take that example. If I hit the target, everybody does one push-up, the whole group. So trust me, when you do that and you're doing your demonstration and you want to uh, have them look at you, they will be watching you like a hawk to see if you hit that target to know if they're going to do that push-up or not. So for me, that's something that works. There's a lot of ways you can figure out for yourself how you can get the students to watch you. But this is one personally that works very well for me. Because if I do that, I do know that they're all watching me definitely like a hawk. Okay. How do you get a student to really listen to you? First, you need to figure out if they are actually listening. So another thing that works for me, I will quickly tell the kids, listen, I'm going to count to 10. And then you guys run around, pick up as many balls as you can when I'm counting to 10. Then I will go one, two, three, four, five, seven, nine, ten. A lot of the kids will just jump up, they will hear the 10 and they will say, okay, I've got five balls, I picked up five balls before you got to 10. But the child that's actually listening to you will be the one that told you, listen, you didn't count correctly. You missed six and you missed eight. So then you know, okay, that one listened to me, the one that just jumped up, they didn't really listen. So when you give your presentation, you know that's the child you have to make a little bit more eye contact with, maybe mention their name, you know they're the one you're going to have to focus on a little bit more to get them talking. Now with learning styles, I'm going to bring in here staying in the presence. This is also something that we learn a lot about in our coaching courses, in the psychology part, and we learn... You have to tell the children, listen, stay in the presence when you're playing a point. Focus on one point at a time. Yes, that's important. You also want them to be in the presence when you're presenting your lesson so that you know they're taking in the information. But now, how do you physically get somebody to stay in the presence? How do you teach that to them without just telling them, listen, focus on the moment. Stay with me. Listen to me. So what works well for me is to get them to use their senses. Before they play a point or before I give a presentation, I really want them to listen. We go through the senses. I tell them, find one thing you see. Okay, I see a car. I see another player. Find one thing you see. Listen. Listen to what you're hearing. Maybe you're hearing somebody talking. You're hearing a car go by. Find something that you can hear. Then something that you can feel. Feel the ball in your hand. Feel the racket in your hand, something you can feel. Then lastly, take a nice deep breath. Smell what you're smelling. Usually for me, I will tell them you'll probably smell your sunscreen, you'll smell your sweat. Maybe somebody's drying something next to the tennis court, making some food, you smell that. But once they use their senses, then they are truly in the presence. Then they are ready to learn. They are focused, they're in the moment, and they will listen to what you have to say. Including children with ADHD in lessons. Have a positive approach, be firm with rules, and stay calm. So when my kids get on a tennis court, they know, okay, we have to close the gate behind us, we greet everybody, we do not run and touch all the equipment quickly, they know we come up, we're organized, we're there. If a child does something that you don't like, they have to know the rules, but you have to stay calm when they do something like that. Just yelling at them, that's not going to work. Then match your coaching style to their learning style. As we discussed now with the learning styles, it's very important to know what type of learner that child is. If you have an auditory learner, yes, you're going to explain a little bit more. You have to be more clear with your instructions with them. If you know it's an audit, like a visual learner, you show them a little bit more. So match your coaching style with their learning style. Know when to back off if their level of frustration or anxiety peaks. 
So it's very important to know your students, to know when they're getting frustrated, when they're feeling anxious on court. But then again, you don't want to single out one player. When you see they're getting frustrated, you don't want to single them out and everybody now knows, okay, that child is getting frustrated. So again, what works for me, I will just simply go, listen guys, mm, my throat is getting a little bit dry. Let's just all have a quick water break. I just need to drink something quickly so that I can feel a little bit better. Or maybe ugh, there's something in my eye. Let's just quickly go off court. You guys can have a quick water break while I quickly go and sort this out. Then they get the opportunity to have a little bit of a breather. But not everybody then knows that's the reason we're quickly stopping the lesson. <coughs> they can just continue and go and have a little bit of a breather. <coughs> have a predictable and organized coaching environment. So for me, when the kids get on court, they know my bag with all my ladders, my agility ladders, my hurdles, the cones, everything is to the left side of the gate. My racket bag is always to the left side of the fence next to the net, net post. So they know when they get on court, everything is in their place. The ball cart is in a specific place. So they know, okay, we're ready to start the lesson. Everything is in their place. We can now continue. Look at the children when you are communicating with them, especially when you realize which one is not listening to you by doing what we spoke about earlier, doing the counting. And it's very important. I know we all wear our glasses on court a lot. Take off your glasses, then you can make eye contact with the children. Then they know when you're looking at them. So just quickly take off your glasses, look them all in the eye, continue with the lesson. Provide immediate and consistent feedback regarding positive behavior. So when the kids are doing a drill and they, some of them doing footwork exercises, you don't have to stop the whole lesson and say, okay, well done, so-and-so. You can just quickly look up and say, Johnny, that's the one I want. That's the way I want you to do it. They will know that you saw them. They will feel good about that because they know in all everything that's going on that you saw that they were doing something correctly. Try to develop a private signal with a participant to notify them when they are off task or acting inappropriately. Again, this is something that you can develop with your children. For me, my children know I just go like this. Then they know they have to quiet down. Because my rule is if my mouth goes like this, your mouth goes like this. So they know if I show them this, they have to quiet down. I am ready to talk. They have to listen. Or if I want them to move their feet, I just stand and I point at my toes. Then they know I'm not happy at that moment with their footwork. They have to move a little bit more. So there's a lot of things you can do. You have to realize what works for you and what will work for your children so that they can understand what you mean. When you're on a different court, you can just quickly show them or you can show them and they will know what they have to do. When speaking or giving instructions to a group, Use the individual's name to attract attention. When asking everyone to come here, some of the individuals may need you to tell them specifically by name to come. So when you're calling the whole group and you say, hi everybody, quickly come closer. Your ADHD child will most likely think you're not including them. So you just go, everybody come here. Johnny, quickly come with us. Let's continue with the lesson. Easy, easy, and they will listen. They will feel part of the lesson. Advantages of tennis for children with ADHD. Tennis, and this goes for everybody, and a lot of you guys know this one, it's an excellent stress release system. When you play tennis, your mind is fo forced to focus on one task at hand. You have to focus on playing a point, so at that moment you're thinking about nothing else. Your stresses, your to-do list, everything goes out of your mind, and you're focusing solely on the tennis. Boosted brain power. Playing tennis can improve critical thinking, mental alertness, tactical thinking by making connections in the brain. Tennis also helps regulate serotonin. It's a brain chemical linked to functions such as sleep cycle, appetite, your emotional state. So a lot of the times children with ADHD, they do take medication and a lot of those medications suppress their eating habits. They don't eat a lot. So if they play tennis, tennis and the serotonin is sorted out a little bit, it's leveled out, they will actually gain a much better appetite and they will have more energy. Yes, they do have a lot of energy, 
but sometimes they do get tired simply because they didn't eat. They didn't think about eating that day. Dynamic balance. The movement of tennis athletes in all directions helps one to develop balance when playing or making movement. The better a child's balance, the better their reading skills becomes. So this is something, if you improve their balance, obviously it's best for their tennis. You need balance as part of your biomech, but their reading skills will improve. Something that can help them in school, improve their marks, and help them feel more positive and better when they're in school. It improves coordination. The coordination gained by playing tennis helps to increase concentration, develop tactical, tactical strategy and mental alertness, which can also be useful in other occupations. Tips for coaching children with ADHD. Now, these following points are very important. Get to know them really well. Find out from the athletes or their parents what has worked, what definitely hasn't worked, how to recognize early signs of frustration and how to get them back on track. So you're going to have to spend time with your children. You're going to have to talk with them. You're going to have to know what frustrates them on a tennis court and learn how to handle them. Get to know your students. Meet them where they are. Let go of standard, standard expectations where you think they should be, be able to do this according to their size. If you see a student walking on court, and a lot of the times I think a lot of coaches are guilty of this thing. You see them coming on court with a nice racket bag, the attitude, everything, and you think, okay, this kid will most likely be this level of play. They will be this according to their age. You know they're a grade 5 student, and you're going to think, okay, this is what's supposed to happen. Do not judge them about how they look, but rather think and get to know them and meet them where they are. If it's a grade 5 learner, and they're still a little bit emotionally behind the other students their age. Help them according to where they are, not where you think they should be. Emphasize the positive. Notice and point out the positive every day, even if you have to really go and look for something. This is money in the relationship bank. It builds confidence and it build, builds trust. Teach them to think positively about themselves. So if you see them doing something correctly, even if they're just picking up quickly balls, tell them, oh, thank you for picking up the ball so quickly. Or thank you for helping me collect the cones. Or you remember that forehand you did two points ago. I really like that. I like your footwork movement when you're playing that point. Notice something and give them a positive feedback, especially if it's something small. If it's a specific point they played and you saw them really enjoying the point, mention that. They will forever remember that and they will always feel more positive when they're in your presence. <clears throat> Let them fidget. ADHD athletes get bored and restless really fast. Find a way for them to fidget appropriately when talking or while they're waiting. Keep the idle time to a minimum. And this is something I realized with one of my students. It was the last lesson of the day. I was explaining a drill to him that we had to do. It was quite a complicated drill we had to do. And he was playing with his racket and the ball going like this, and I'm like, please, stand still, look at me, listen to me. I explained the drill again, we did it, and he was making mistakes the whole time, going to the wrong part of the court, hitting to the wrong directions, so I called him in, I said, listen, and then, as I said, it was the last lesson of the day, so I was there thinking, oh, you know what, if you're not going to listen to me, and you're going to keep fidgeting, it's your problem if you're not going to do this, so I let him fidget, and I explained the whole drill again. And then when he did it, he did everything perfectly. So for him, it was normal to stand there fidgeting with his racket and the ball. And he was listening. So that was a bit of an eye-opener for me. So I had to realize which students need to stand still and focus and listen to you. Which ones you have to let them fidget a little bit because they're used to that. They will still listen to you while playing with that racket, playing with that ball, twirling their racket. Let them fidget. Keep your speeches very short. Lecturing doesn't work. Even with short tasks, ask them to repeat back what they heard. So quickly say what you want them to do. Ask them uh, to repeat something back. But it's not going to help to give them this big, long speech about what they have to do. Keep it short and simple. Set up familiar routines and strategies and stick to them. Talk to all of your kids about tools for Tools for say, staying organized and in control. 
For example, having calendars, having lists, mindful breathing, arriving at practice early to help set up the court, or when we're done with the lesson to help you quickly pack up the court. Give them a special daily job. I have one child where if he doesn't get a little bit of a job, he'll, he'll sometimes look a bit down. But when I tell him, okay, your job today is just to every time push the ball cart to where we're picking up balls, he feels important. He feels like he's included in the lesson. He loves doing that. So find out what they like to do. Sometimes I like picking up the cones and organizing them according to color. This child, as I said, he likes pushing the ball cart. Give them all a little bit of a task, help them feel included in the lesson. Do not threaten or punish. It won't work. These athletes live in the moment. This can make it harder to learn from past experiences or look to the future, but they will eventually learn from natural consequences. So when you did a lesson, and you maybe did your lesson on a specific footwork pattern or recovery to the right positions on the court to recover during a drill, and you see them during the lesson, they're not focusing, they're not uh, getting back to the correct part of the court where they have to recover to. Let them be for a moment and then let them go and play points. They will come back to you and they say, yo, coach, listen, I couldn't play points. I couldn't get to the ball. And then you can go, instead of yelling at them and screaming, saying, yeah, but you didn't recover. You didn't do this. You didn't do that. Rather ask him, okay, so what was it with, that we were doing in this lesson? And they'll tell you, okay, we were working on recovery. And then you'll ask them, but did you recover when you were playing points? Did you recover to the correct places on the court? Then they'll say no. And then you'll say, aha. And they will learn that their actions have consequences. So let them learn through that. That way, and this goes for all students, they will remember that forever, that if I didn't recover, I lost points. Even in practice, I lost it during a match. So next time, okay, I will be working a little bit harder during the lesson to focus and I will learn how to do the drills I need to do that will help me when playing points. Turn down the volume and be mindful of facial expressions. Their sensitive brains can hear softly spoken constructive criticism as angry screaming and they can see a frustrated glance as a furious glare. And like all kids, they will model your emotional energy, calm or otherwise. So when your student is busy playing a match, you have to be very careful of your body language next to the court. They might see you going oh, when they lost a point and that will stick with them. And then their shoulders will start dropping because they will be mimicking what you were doing next to the court. So be very mindful of your body language when giving lessons, when being next to the court, when they're playing matches. They will pick up on it very, very quickly. And because they're sometimes a lot anxious, they will start getting more anxious on the court and thinking only about the mistakes they made because of what you did next to the court. Slow down in conversation. Wait out pauses in their speech and be certain that they are finished before jumping in. Be patient and hear them out if they interrupt. If they don't get to speak right away, they could lose their thought. So yes, sometimes they will take a bit of a pause. They will start telling you this long story. Give them a moment to get to the point where they are. Even if it does take a little bit of time out of your lesson, let them finish. Then you will get to know them. You will learn more about how they communicate. So do just give them, even if it's just a minute, just give them that moment to collect their thoughts and talk to you. That way in future, they will feel more comfortable in coming to you and discussing with you if they don't understand something or if they had a difficult day, they will come to you. Let them fly under the radar. Do not ask them in front of their peers to answer questions unless you know they are comfortable with it. So if you're asking the group questions, rather just do the old-fashioned way, let them put up a hand. You will see that they sometimes don't put up their hand, they don't want to answer the questions. Then you know, okay, I'm not going to ask you in front of the group. But then sometimes you want to know if they understood the lesson or the tactic or whatever you're working on. Then when you're picking up balls or you're walking to a water break, go to them and ask them that question in private. Then if they answer you know, okay, this and this, they 
they understand what's going on or they don't and you can explain it a little bit better. Be patient. Understand that their stories might seem off or out of sequence. They might forget directions and belongings. They might need more reps before the technique or tactics set in. Remember how much harder they have to try. So, yes, sometimes they will start the story way back when, when they were in grade one and end the story where they entered grade five. But in that story, you will realize what they want to tell you. What's important there is also, yes, sometimes that story can get off point. So what you can do is just tell them, listen, we need to continue with the lesson. But when we are drinking water, or when we're picking up balls, I would love to hear the rest of your story. So always encourage them to communicate with them. Get physical. Walk with them through the plays, the drills, the techniques. So if you have a specific footwork exercise you want them to do, walk through it slowly so that they can see you do it. Don't be scared to do the whole drill or exercise so that they can see what they have to do. Now, practical examples of, of lessons. First, I'm going to start here by talking a little bit about the cerebellum. So all of us have probably heard about the cerebellum. It's a little part in the back of your brain. It's got everything to do with movement, from flicking your fingers to blinking your eyes to moving your toes. Everything with movement and balance is the cerebellum. So I read an interesting article about a neurologist in the UK that said that if you're looking at how the brain works when you're playing tennis, a lot of times a kid will be hitting a ball late. And we all know as coaches, sometimes we go out of our minds when a child hits a ball late. But what, what is actually happening when they're hitting that ball late? They had the perfect footwork pattern, the technique was fine, but they're still hitting that ball late. So what basically is happening there is the cerebellum is taking over at that point. They have to run to a wide ball. What's happening, the cerebellum is thinking, don't fall, don't fall, don't fall. Stay up, don't fall, okay, hit the forehand. So simply the signal from the brain to the arm is just taking a little bit longer to get there. So some of the exercises I'm going to explain now will actually help them to free up their mind and get into that autonomous phase a little bit sooner and a little bit easier so that they don't make those mistakes. And then hit bounce and not bounce hit. A lot of the times we will tell the child, think bounce hit, bounce hit to get into the rhythm to see the ball early. But children with ADHD, their eyes vibrate a little bit faster. So they tend to see the balls a little bit later. So easy thing for them, when their opponent hits the ball, they say hit. And when the ball bounces, they say bounce. Then they see the ball early enough and that will also eliminate a little bit of the children hitting the balls late. So three exercises that I like to do a lot with my children just to get them focused in playing and to open their minds a little bit is the three colors one. So if you set up a drill, maybe they have to go forehand, backhand approach. Before they start the drill, you will name three colors. You will tell them pink, blue, purple. When they finish the drill, they have to just repeat those colors back to you. And what I've noticed when doing this exercise, I will let the children do a couple of rounds without saying anything. Sometimes their minds are all over, the balls are flying all over, they're not going to the correct places, not hitting to the correct areas where you want them to hit. But once you start adding that, they are a little bit more focused. They're thinking about the colors they need to remember and autonomously they're just doing what they have to do in the drill. So that's the one that I really like to use a lot, the three colors. And maths. I do like to ask them a maths question, just five plus five, three plus two. Just something quickly before they start the drill, just to get the mind quickly focused. Then they do the drill and they will go through it. The alphabet. As we know, the balance is important in tennis. The better the balance, the better the reading skills. So what I do a lot of times, I will tell the children, okay, Stand on your left leg and repeat the alphabet after me. Then we do the right leg, they repeat the alphabet. Because they are physically busy doing something and thinking when they're doing that, the connections in their brain for the balance will become a little bit better. So these are just uh, three lessons that I like to do and things like little things I bring in. I will be 
in later videos giving a lot more exercises focusing on a lot more of these topics to give more examples to show you guys a little bit more what you can do on court with children with ADHD. Thank you very much for listening.